Welcome back to another episode of In Systems We Trust. My name is Marky. I'm your host. And today I'm speaking with David Jennings. David, in 2016, successfully systemized himself out of his business, one of Australia's most trusted digital agencies, MelbourneSEOServices.com. Through this process, he became a systems devotee, founding System Hub and Systemology. Today, his mission is to free all business owners worldwide from the daily operations of running their business. Welcome to the show, David. Pleasure to be here. Very much looking forward to this episode. Awesome. Yeah, like we just uh, identified, I mean, we're both systems-minded people. I'm looking forward to this chat. I've heard a lot about your book, um, and I'm looking forward to, to diving in today. So thanks for staying up late for me uh, so we can have this chat. Yeah, pleasure. So let's just dive right in, David. I'd love to start and just hear about your entrepreneurial journey. Um, we're going to talk systems today, but I want to hear about how you got your start and how you got to the place that you are right now. Mm. I've always been a business owner from when I left school, didn't go to university, tried a bunch of different things. And quite a few of the different businesses always seem to have a systems current to them. I was in the stock market education space and we would build trading systems. And that was about, you know, predefining rules that you would follow. And then we also set up a rock and roll clothing music store that uh, we looked to franchise and model off Hot Topic and bring it out to Australia here uh, with the idea of rolling that out as a franchise. So obviously we had head office manuals and store manuals and we rolled that out to three stores and lots of different businesses in between. Uh, but the last business, which that was the digital agency, and that's really where I got stuck in in the day-to-day -day operations. It was a bit funny because I, even though I knew systems were important and I'd used them previously in the digital agency, I thought, ah, this business is different. I thought we were a creative digital agency and we can't systemize because that would remove the creativity. And I thought my team's not going to want to follow the systems because we're creative. And I was so up to date with the current trends and what was happening online that I thought I was the guy and I was solving the problems, whether it was for staff or clients. And I just built this business very much centered around me. And it was not until we found out that we were pregnant that I kind of had that moment when I thought, I don't want to be that dad who's always too busy. I could see this digital agency really consuming uh, a huge amount of my time. So I had a, a clear deadline. We were uh, had our firstborn due in nine months and I thought, right, I need to get to work and worked with our time. Uh, operations lady and kind of promoted her and really focused on systemizing that business. And that was a huge uh, turning point for me because at the end of that, it took a little bit longer than the nine months, but I stepped away and took a year off and kind of looked from the outside in and, and let a lady that I promoted up into that position run the business. And I was so hands off that it just started to really change my perspective on systems and, and building business and being a business owner. Okay. It's incredible what you can do when you have like a, a defined timeline, nothing like kids on the way to make you really change your focus and, and get things together. Um, curious with your background at your digital agency, I mean, I've heard that so many times. I used to run my own marketing agency. Um, we've heard from, you know, creatives on even my team at the time, you know, that systems were difficult to implement and follow because they needed time and space to think and ideate and be creative. And so I definitely understand uh, where you're coming from there. But with you as the owner of that business, where were you getting stuck the most, right? You were trying to roll systems mm. out. Where was it not working? Mm. Probably the biggest thing is I just inserted myself in any challenges that arose. So whether the staff were coming to me or clients were coming to me, a lot of the marketing was me talking about current trends. So the prospects would become aware of me and then want to speak to me. And then we'd have the first mm -hmm. relationship where we'd bond and then it would be hard to pass them off to the account manager. And yeah, we kind of really boxed myself in and we'd got quite a lot of requests as a digital agency for creating video content. Cause that was kind of as YouTube was starting to break and I wasn't mm. a YouTube guy, like I'm not a video guy. So I didn't know how to work the camera or do the editing. And I hired someone to do uh, the, the video part of things and I couldn't get on the tools. And I went through this period working with him, which is, 
really a creative endeavor, like anything video, there's a lot of creativity that goes in there. But we systemized everything around that creativity, like what you would pack before you go out on a shoot and how you would pre-discuss with the client the way the shoot was going to go down. And when you came back, how you would ingest the footage and all this stuff, we systemized all around the creative aspects. And seeing that happen, that was kind of like that, oh, I know it can be done because I could see it done in a small pocket of the business, yeah. but everything else I was still, you know, very much tied to. Okay. And were you still running the SEO business at the time that you were starting up Systems Hub and um, Systemology or was there a, a clear cutoff when you, when you transitioned over? Mm. So I had System Hub building up. Initially, it was kind of to scratch our own itch because we didn't have a place to store our systems and our processes. We were using Google Drive and we just migrated from Dropbox and it was really just an unorganized mess uh, of, of documents inside some folders. So yeah. we started working on a platform called System Hub to, to house the systems and the processes. So it was kind of like that side project. And when I ended up taking a year out and I stepped back from the digital agency, I, I found I'd lost the passion for the digital marketing and I just, it wasn't exciting me like it once did. And I had a really strange experience in that sort of period that I took off completely out of the blue. I got a message from a lady called Luz Delia Gerber and I only knew the surname Gerber. I didn't know the first name. And all the email said was call me. And I, I called the phone number and I knew that the Gerbers um, were on the West Coast in the US and I, I'm in Melbourne. So it was my morning there late afternoon. And I called her up and, and you know, introduced myself, said, look, I'm, I'm just calling uh, you back. You, you left this message to call you. She'd responded to uh, an email that I'd sent out on, on um, from our database. And she, she said, look, I mean, I saw you do a book launch. It was my first book launch. Uh, the uh, It was uh, authority content. And I saw what you did there. And my husband, I don't know if you've heard of him, Michael E. Gerber, uh, oh, which wow. was the author I... of, of the Emu. <laughs> I didn't uh, even catch which, that. Yeah, she uh, said, uh, look, he's uh, about to launch the last book in his Emu series. He just turned 80 and he wrote the final book called Beyond the Emu. And for the first time, we... Uh, we want to go through and maintain the rights rather than going through our publisher, HarperCollins. We want to kind of maintain the rights. So we're going to launch the book, but we don't really know how to launch books. And we happen to see your book launch. Uh, would you be interested in doing Michael's book launch? And I, like, they didn't yes. know what I was doing with System Hub or Systemology or any of that. And I said, look, I don't launch books. That's not my thing. I, I do run a digital agency and I, I did mine, but, you know, it would be an absolute pleasure to, to be able to work closely with Michael. So I went, uh, I, I was off the tools at Melbourne SEO at the time. So I had the space to be able to go all in on it and, and worked for, it was about four months quite solidly. And it was such a great experience to work so closely with Michael. And when we launched the book, it was his first book to go uh, number one on Amazon in uh, a really short space in time. And then he wow. invited us over to, uh, the US, he was running an event he called The Dreaming Room. Uh, and I, I was quite fortunate at the end of that. Um, he, he had this collection of the who's who in business because he'd rented out or, or was in the presidential suite at the um, uh, location where The Dreaming Room was in, in Carlsbad, California. And um, he said, well, come back. I'm running a, a private mastermind at the end to kind of talk about the future of the e-myth and the direction and where it's going to go. So I got to um, sit in on that particular event. And at the end of all of that, uh, the, his wife, uh, Luz Delia, had said that they were so impressed with the whole experience. Would I be interested in uh, running the e-myth business? And that's when my jaw kind of hit the ground uh, wow. I wasn't able to take up the opportunity. I've, I've got, you know, family and my wife and we're all based here in Melbourne and she's got a big Maltese family and there's no way that we'd be moving to the States for that particular role. But it was, it was a weird series of events where I'd stepped back from Melbourne SEO. It's like the universe opened up and delivered this amazing 
opportunity into my lap. I got to work really mm-hmm. closely with Michael. He actually ended up writing the forward to my book, Systemology, and wow. uh, we kind of keep in touch beyond that. But it was it's almost like that moment when it was like the the passion got reignited in me and I had System Hub and Systemology was just kind of like early days thought, but that was really the opportunity for me to go all in on the work that I do with systems and really try and bring a lot of the e-myth work um, uh, and, and make it a little bit more current, a, a lot of mm-hmm. the, sort of the thinking. Uh, I think, you know, when Michael originally came up with the idea, um, wasn't aware of a lot of the trends that we're seeing now and, and where systems are stored and AI and all the rest of it. So I feel like I'm now stepping into that place. And are you, are you still involved in the business, the e-myth business? Yeah, look, I chat with Michael and Luz Delia. Um, okay. I'm, I don't kind of work in that uh, particular business, um, but we're kind of colleagues and touch base. Okay. Look, I, I say colleagues, but really, I mean, he's, he, he's kind of more someone that I'd look up to as like, you know, the godfather yeah. of business systems, uh, particularly for small business, not, not like, you know, lean or six Sigma or, you know, the process sure. improvement stuff, but for small business, he really yeah. pioneered a lot of that space. Absolutely. He did. I mean, and what a cool thing for you to be a part of as well. I mean, I first read the e Revisited in 2015. So I was doing some freelance digital marketing work while working for a big corporation and I was transitioning. So similar to you, my kids were on the way. Um, I have twin boys and they're now um, seven years old, um, almost eight. And I was like, what are my next steps going to be? Someone suggested, a mentor of mine suggested the e Revisited and I read it and I, I, I've said this before and I don't like say it lightly, it changed my life. And there's like, maybe apart from the Bible, it's like there hasn't been another book that has changed my life and changed my thinking, right? Around systems and, biz- and the business approach. And to your point, um, for the small business owner, it's the perfect roadmap for how to build a business properly, how to obsess over systems. And it was really from reading that book where I was able to transition from marketing freelancer to operations, um, you know, kind of systems minded person like yourself. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's incredible that, you know, you, you had that connection, but yeah, Michael's done some incredible, incredible work. Um, very cool. So let's talk a bit about systems hub. And then I want to talk about your book systemology, because I know that there's Mm -hmm. like a lot in there that we can definitely unpack. Um, we should have probably done this a little bit earlier, but what is a systems hub? Let, let's yeah. kind of identify that and then we'll get into the book a little bit and talk through some of those, um, the methodologies that are in there. Mm. So system hub is just a place to store your systems, policies and trainings. And it's a way to simplify the way that it's organized. It's purpose built. You've got permission controls around who can see what. And it's kind of like the graduation where maybe you do start off with Google Docs and you've got some folders with your different departments and you capture some of the systems into uh, different files. Over time, that can get a little bit unorganized, especially, you know, if you're not OCD when it comes to attention to detail and how things are formatted and all those sorts of things. Uh, So System Hub is is a way to kind of graduate to that next step. Uh, Without going overboard, like my belief is systems and processes at the best of times, uh, can introduce friction for some team members and especially ones that have been doing things a particular way. Sometimes it's hard to get them to make adjustments or new team members to kind of constantly keep it in front. So we try and think about simplification. What is the minimum things required for systems and processes to work? Don't need all the bells and whistles and we try and go the opposite rather than loading it with features. We try and slim it right down to try and make it as lightweight as possible. And so is this for um, teams that are, you know, at scale already and just need a a way to stay organized and on the same page or is it tailored more towards onboarding or is it just for general documentation? Mm. Um, I'd say it's going from the business that doesn't really have many systems or processes in place just yet or a handful they're probably a small team oftentimes anywhere from probably about three to 50 staff 
is yeah. oftentimes uh, the type of client that we work with and yeah. uh, we we help them capture in a simple way the the how to documents the the systems and the processes uh, we help them build up a policy handbook you know like the yeah. uh, the handbook that that explains the way that the company works this is how we do things here uh, and yeah. then there's an area also for some training so it's not like a uh, an LMS uh, you know that that optimizes maybe for onboarding new team members and um, they've got different channels and quizzes and all those sorts of things it's just a very simple place to kind of organize and store some of your onboarding processes okay. and I'm curious with your customers um, I'm not sure if you have these numbers or you've, you've seen any trends with your users but what does adoption typically look like around the tool because I know you said that your goal was to really um, keep it lean keep it straightforward you know no bells and whistles right and I find a lot of times in in businesses, you know, we have tools and we're maybe changing constantly and then there is resistance around certain tools. So what does it look like from your perspective when, when users are, are approaching System Hub? Mm. Uh, one thing that we try and make System Hub, it's almost like a project management platform agnostic. So okay. we're really separated uh, out what System Hub does. It's about organizing and storing. It's not about delegating who's doing this particular task and it's due by this particular date and they would report that it was done. So we kind of really separate the two and because it just organizes the systems and each system has its own URL, we kind of teach that it's a great idea to have a project management platform where you assign out tasks and in the description to the task uh, that you might assign to a team member, you just link to the system that explains how that particular task is done. So it's, we try and do it in a, a very easy way. And then we, we layer in, like it started off with system hub, but then I started to dig into what's the difference between the companies that build a systems culture versus those that don't and the companies that yeah. use system hub versus those that don't. And then that's really where a lot of the work with systemology came from, which is more thinking well, how do we build a systems culture? What are the steps? Which systems do we build first? How do we get yeah. the team involved and on board? And uh, what does that process look like? So system hub yeah. is the software, whereas systemology is more the thinking. Mm. That was going to be my next question is like, where do we start? Right? Yeah. I'd love to, to chat around that because something you said was interesting, creating a systems culture. I was on a, um, I had a guest on a few weeks ago now, we were talking about culture specifically. And culture, typically, when you look at an organization, is limited to how people feel and do we have enough happy hours or events and things like that. And, you know, that's, you know, in, in a lot of cases, an attempt to make a positive culture. But there is culture within a business no matter what, right? And the question is, is do you have a positive culture or a negative culture? Are people fearful and you know fearing for their jobs, or, or do they want to come to work and be there? And so we're talking about systems culture. In mm. your understanding of of the term, what does that look like? Mm. Having a, a culture around systems, and then where do we start? Yes, yeah. So with regards to the culture, the way that I like to think about it is uh, it's reaching the point at which the team says, this is how we do things here. As you're kind yeah. of going through the journey mm. and you're introducing systems and processes, you need to remind people to follow process. You know, you need to uh, really focus on developing those systems. And it's a little bit like you're pushing a rock up a hill. Like at the start, there's that's where most of the resistance is going to come from. If you are going to have team members that push back, they'll push back early. And it's not until you kind of get over this hump that then things get a lot easier. So yeah. uh, when I think about it early on, uh, and some of this comes from uh, reading Atomic Habits by James Clear. And yeah. what we need to do is you need to drop the evidence around the business and for team members that you are a systems driven company. So it's little things like, you know, if you're a bricks and mortar business, maybe you have QR codes that are stuck to the machinery inside the factory 
that you can scan and it jumps to the system that shows you how to, how to set up that piece of equipment. Or maybe it's sticky notes on the computers reminding you to make a process, or maybe it's getting a bunch of mouse pads saying, you know, am I going to do this again? Let's create a system. It's, right. um, what are all of the little things that you can do? Is it having it as an agenda item on your weekly team meeting where you showcase a system or you celebrate system wins? So early on, you need to try and plant as many of these seeds as possible and keep kind of watering them. And we, we talk about this idea of identifying a systems champion whose role it is in the business to keep this front and center until the point at which yeah the culture really starts to take hold and then it starts to evolve to this is how we do things here. And every new team member gets you one step closer because most of the resistance will come from those existing team members, but a new team member comes on board and they're used to seeing all of these things. And it's part of the onboarding that you teach them that we have a systems culture and the way that you move up in our organization is to capture and codify what you're doing and delegate down and that, makes you more valuable to the team because now you can work on higher value tasks. It's putting all of that programming in up front really helps to shape uh, the system side of things. And, and you mentioned a few things on culture. I, I mainly just focus in on the systems piece. Uh, that, yeah. That's kind of really where, where we kind of add the most value. No, that makes sense because I think that there's like, there's systems in everything, right? Like, um, can't remember the, the name of the author, but thinking in systems, right? Like if we approach it from that perspective, like I, I think we can create areas in our business where there are specific systems and then build culture around how those systems help us grow and operate and stay on the same page. Um, thinking about systems, like you were, you were holding up a mouse pad um, for the, for the listeners where it says like, are we going to do this again? You know, you know, create systems. Um, and so like for us, so like we're an all remote um, company and there are two kinds of systems we we've, we've created and methods by which we enforce this and create this culture and one of them is um, if someone is you know asking for something or sharing something in in say slack or asking you know a team member to do, to do something it's is it in asana right and then it's like encouraging people to go back there and all of our sops are listed in asana and so if there's a question that comes up right oftentimes it will be a link in the Slack channel or wherever it is, back to the SOP that's in Asana. So we always are thinking about where is the work happening, Asana, mm -hmm. right? And the documentation should also be happening there, right? Communication should be happening there, um, all inside of one place. So I'm a huge believer yeah. in that. So I, I love that you're dropping these little pieces of, of evidence. Um, that's great. Let's discuss your book, Systemology, right? Create time, reduce errors, and scale your profits with proven business systems. So this is for the business owner. I, I would love if you can just walk us through. I, I'd like to understand first how you got to the point where you decided that it was time to write a book, mm -mm. right? What your process looked like writing the book. And then we can talk about um, some of the, the methodologies that you break down in yeah. the book. So... The book I'm finding, because it was a second, my second book, the first book was uh, one that I used in the digital agency called Authority Content. And the thing I love about writing books is it's a fantastic way to just clarify thought. And you have to strip away all of the uh, less important pieces until you're left with only your best bits and your best framework. So with System Hub, I'm going through this process of thinking about, well, where are business owners getting stuck and why do some people systemize and some not? And what are the stages or steps I would guide someone through to help go from, I don't have any systems to I now have minimum viable systems. And right. the business owner is really the one that I wanted to kind of sell this whole idea first, because they oftentimes are the leader and they, whether they're the one documenting the process or not, which I don't recommend that they are, but they still need to be the one that goes, I get it. This is important. We will prioritize yeah. this. I will lead this because this is important to us. So I wrote the book as a 
um, a visionary business owner who doesn't really like writing systems and processes. Like I, I don't enjoy documenting process, uh, but I, I fell in love with what the systems and processes can bring. So I yes. knew I could write that message to the business owner and really speak to them and help them to understand that this is worthy and you should be putting time, attention and resource on this and it's accessible for you. Even if you don't see yourself as a systems person, that doesn't mean you can't build a systems driven business. You just, yeah. you need to have a, a process. And I always thought with the e-myth for me, when I read it, it really helped to build the case why, but the bit that I felt was missing was the how to, you know, what systems do I build first? Yeah. Who's going to build the systems? How do I get it out of their head? Where am I going to store it? How do I get the team involved? How do I scale my business and how do we optimize? So I tried to take some of that thinking and think about some of the misconceptions people have around systems. Uh, and also I built that into the book. So it's kind of like a seven step framework and uh, we, can, we can go through that. But it starts off by answering the question, well, where do you start? what are the 10 to 15 systems? Because most business owners, when they think about systemizing a business, they overcomplicate it and they think they're going to have to create hundreds of systems. And they look at yeah. a business like McDonald's and think, wow, they've got every aspect of their business systemized. I have to do that. When really, when you're getting started, you need to apply the 80-20. What are the, the critical few systems that are most important uh, for for driving the business and how do we identify those and how do we minimize them down to 10 to 15 so you've got somewhere to start because just because you don't systemize something doesn't mean it's going to magically stop happening your business still yeah. works the systemization yeah. is about making it repeatable and consistent and delegating down and it's part of the scale process uh, but again that doesn't mean that things stop happening in your business right um, I definitely want to go through this, the seven steps and, and talk through those. But you said something before getting to that point. It's that, you know, you don't like documenting, but you understand and, and know what systems and processes can do for you. So I'd love to hear from your perspective when you identified that for yourself, what changed for you? Mm. What, what did implementing these systems do for you? Mm particularly when we had the video production business and I started to see that part of the business make a profit without me involved, as in we were able oh, yes. to take incoming inquiries, chat with those leads, convert them, deliver a video. The client was really happy and we'd get them to come back. And I had a few team members who would help with the execution on that. And I just wasn't involved in the process. And, and then I saw, wow, as a business owner, I get paid not for my time, but I get the profit that comes out the other end. And then yeah. it started to get me thinking about, well, how do the economies of this business work? And what does the profit margin need to be to make sure that I can employ the right team members who can execute and do it to a right standard, you know, and still make sure that there's profit at the end to be rewarded, like to reward me as the business owner. So a lot of that thinking, I kind of went through, through that process and just to know it's possible because a lot of business owners, when they start a business, they are everything. They are the bottle washer, they're the person who stocks the shelves, the salesperson, the finance person, the marketer, the everything. And they yeah. build that business from the ground up and then that's all they know. So it, it then becomes very hard for them to break out of that model because the, the successful business that they may have built up to one level has been because they're everything. And that's what right. makes it really, really hard to, to see it as possible for them to work without them in it. Right. That, that's awesome. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Not having you involved, seeing that profit, I can see how that would be hugely beneficial. Um, and so like there's, there's typically this concept around like freedom and it looks different for so many different people, but like, is that what you were after? Were you looking for some kind of freedom so you can focus on different areas? Um, 
I'd, I'd love to know like what you did with that additional time even, right? Mm. When, when you realize that click, because what you said there is like, yes, I've come across that. I've been that person, right? Where you start as a freelancer and you found an agency and you're doing absolutely everything. And then bit by bit, it starts to click. Sorry, if it starts to click and you start to put in these systems, you realize I don't have to be that person. My job is not to keep doing it, doing it, doing it, like Michael Gerber would say, right? It's to create the system so that I can bring in someone else and delegate to them and empower them to do the work as well. So what really changed for you? Like, where did you start focusing and rearranging as systems became more um, evident or um, Mm. took the center stage in your business? Uh, I started to really focus on the things that I'm best at. And I then tried to think, well, what parts of the business do I add the most value to? What are my highest value tasks? And how can I spend more time doing those and less time on the things that I don't necessarily enjoy or I'm not adding much value to the business? So a big part for me is things like writing the book and creating the space to do that. It's the marketing side of things. It's YouTube videos. It's content creation. It's some of the marketing stuff, which I uh, enjoy doing as well. And thinking about the business at that higher level, because as you start to create the space and you use systems to solve some of these problems that pop up, oftentimes they're recurring problems. Once you solve those, it's not like the problems stop. You, You just create space to solve higher quality problems and the business owner just keeps leveling up. Right. So rather than solving the problem of I got to answer the phone, you then start to think more strategically because you have the space to be able to think about different parts of your business. So some, some things have changed for me. Like I still work hard, um, but with, you know, the arrival of my kids, I usually, you know, box it into nine to five, um, Monday to Friday, a little bit of time here and there, not a huge amount of time. And we try and, have some vacations and things like that. Whereas previously I, I I wasn't really able to do that. I was thinking about the business all the time. If I went away on vacation, either a truckload of fires would happen or I'd have to be doing work while I was on vacation. So yeah, kind of making some of those changes, but I still work hard because I, I love the work that I do, but I'm kind of working on different things and I'm, I'm learning better how to kind of put it in a box and how to also give other aspects of my life some attention to. Absolutely. And I'm sure everyone listening can resonate with exactly what you just said, right? Having that time, being able to take vacation and not have it to worry about the work. Um, so let's, let's get back to the book then. Let's, let's walk through those, those, um, the seven step formula that you've created. Um, maybe give us the Coles notes here and how it can apply to the listener today. Yeah, sure. So the seven steps, it's uh, define, assign, extract, organize, uh, integrate, scale, and optimize. So the first one, define, that answers the question, well, where do you start? And the way that you do that, I just got a little exercise called a critical client flow, because I believe that the business needs to be able to profitably deliver the core product or service. So you just on an A4 bit of paper, you map out the flow of how do you get the attention of your target audience? How do you sell them? How do you onboard them? How do you deliver your core product or service? And then how do you get them to hand over and get them to repeat? So we visually map that out on an A4 bit of paper, not more than a few words in each box to describe it. Because the purpose there is really to identify high level here's what goes on in the business. And if we could make that happen without key person dependency, then the business can make money without key person dependency. And most problems in business can be solved with cash and hiring the right people and doing those things. So my first primary objective is, can we get the business to make money without any key person dependency, you know, whether that's the business owner or any other team member for that matter. So we go through that exercise in step number one to identify 10 to 15 systems. And sometimes we go a little bit further where we go in that critical client flow, where is the current bottleneck or where is the pain? Where is the ball getting dropped? And we try and go to work on that piece first. 
Step number two is assign. That's when we start to think about well, where does this knowledge currently reside? Now, most of the business owners that I'm working with have small teams around them. So you might go, hey, Jenny answers the phone. She does it better than anyone else. Let's find out what Jenny says and let's capture that. So you think about in the critical client flow, who does each of those different tasks? And that's the assign stage. The next stage is extract. That's how do we get it out of the brain of that person. So Jenny knows how to do it, but Jenny might not like doing documentation or she might be busy and she might not have space. So we talk about this idea of uh, making it a two person job and you have someone who watches the person do the task and then another person who might take a recording and write out some notes and effectively create version one of the documentation. So that's the uh, step number three, extract. Step number four, is organize, which is just where is this knowledge going to live, a centralized location, and how will it integrate with your project management platforms? Step number five is integrate. And that's a lot to do with now, how do we get the team on board? How do we build the systems culture and do some of the things that we talked about to get the team to reach the point where they say, this is how we do things here. Step number six is uh, what we call scale, and that's about identifying the systems uh, that need to exist in the business outside of the critical client flow. Because step number one, we just identified 10 to 15 systems, but there are other systems maybe in finance or HR or management or some of the other departments might need some systems. But the whole goal of step number six is to reach what we call minimum viable systems. What is the minimum number of systems required to have the most important tasks in your business defined and documented? And then the final stage is optimize. So systemology is a little bit different from things like Lean and Six Sigma, where they're process improvement methodologies, which pre-assumes you have a process that you're looking to improve where systemology is more of a process capture. What's currently working? How do we bring everybody up to that standard? That becomes your baseline. And it's not until step number seven that we then start to think about putting in a dashboard and making some improvements and adjustments depending on which systems are broken. Um, I mean, that's quite a high level view of the seven stages, but you know, you being a systems person, you'll probably get it and probably even spot some of the nuance in there. I absolutely get it. Yeah. My question is around like, how did you develop the framework? Like it makes absolute sense. And from the way that you described it, it sounds like anyone who's reading this, you know, if you're a leader or a business team manager, um, you, you really get to understand and see where the culture around documentation comes in, right? Starting with identifying you know, the critical client flow, those 10 to 15 systems, extracting that information from your team members, because you said it earlier, it's not the job of the leader or the business owner to document everything, right? We, we, we share that responsibility. And so I, I love the approach, but I can only assume though, and maybe this is getting into like how the book came to be, what did the process of like getting through and fine tuning these seven steps look mm. like? Um, did you see it in you know, um, in your business, were you coaching and prescribing this and, and came up with it that way? I'd love to see and hear mm. about what that process looked like. When I stepped away from the digital agency and I took a year off, I had a couple of people around that time also seeing once the Gerber thing fell in my lap, I actually started coaching just a handful of business owners. We had a little group where we would basically get together every week, once a week, and we would talk through systemization. That's really how it started and kind of went on that journey for a little while and started to solidify some of my thinking. And I ended up running an event, uh, which was the way that I ended up writing the book. I ran a live event and I imagined that each one of the sessions that I was running was a chapter in the book. Oh, and okay. I presented to, I had uh, a handful of people that I said, well, come along. I'm going to walk through my process. We recorded the event. We had a video production company, so that was nice and easy. And yes. then we transcribed it. And then I sent it off to the ghostwriter. And then that was actually 
the first draft of the book. It came back. I I ended up rewriting every word that the ghost writer had written, um, but yeah. I found it infinitely easier to work with 50,000 words that he had pre-written for me than trying so to do it from a, a blank page. Um, it's the same philosophy when I think about systems and processes. If you go to a really knowledgeable team member, they are busy and they might not even writing, like writing process, but if you make it a two-person task, you get someone else to have the first crack at it and then they send it back to the knowledgeable worker, that knowledgeable yeah. worker is oftentimes finds it much easier to edit. And it was, yeah, it's that, right. that same thinking for me. And that's where I got the first draft. And then uh, I, I did move a few of the stages around as we kind of tested it. It was really working quite closely. We had uh, at that point in time, a good few hundred companies on system hub. Um, so I could get feedback from them, early review, find out what was working and what was not because we kind of had a small group right. that I could work with. That's so cool. I love that you did that. I mean, I, I wrote my first manuscript um, at the beginning of this year, sent it to beta. I'm now writing version two and going through it. And like, it, it's almost like the book is never finished because every conversation I have, every engagement I have with a client, every day I learn something new and I'm like, no, this needs to be in the book now, yeah. right? And so my first version of it, my draft came out of a course that I created for HR professionals on how to optimize their systems. And um, it's, it was about process improvement. So the title of the book is Process Over Perfect, right? And talking about it. the iteration of process rather than needing to make it perfect. And because that is one of those daunting things that you've already said for business owners, they think that they have to do everything all at once. It's super overwhelming and they have this you know, paralysis by analysis and they don't actually do anything. So it's about starting small, iterating over time. And then, you know, you have this, this system that's, you know, evolved with you and grown as you have grown. And so with, with that in mind, what are some of the, the misconceptions that you've seen in this space around systems and documentation mm -hmm. and, and really putting them into your business from the perspective of the business owner? Probably one of the biggest ones, and it speaks exactly to the topic of your book, is people try and systemize like McDonald's. And right. I talk about this idea that McDonald's is a hamburger business that has been systemizing for 60 years, and you're looking at the output and where it is today and thinking that you need to systemize like that. There's a good chance yeah. you don't run a hamburger business. There's a good chance that you're not trying to get 15 year old kids off the street to learn how to flip hamburgers. There's a, a good chance as well. Like you're looking at the end product. If you watch the movie, the founder, uh, which is, yeah. you know, the, the story about McDonald's and the uh, Ray Kroc and the McDonald's brothers, one of the early mm -hmm. scenes when they're creating the McDonald's system, the, uh, I think they called it the speedy system. They went out onto a basketball court and they had some chalk and they basically chalked out the floor of a McDonald's store. And they said, oh, let's put the fryer here. Let's put the soft drink machine here. Oh, let's have the counter here. Oh, let's have the drive through over here. No, let's move that around. And that's the way that mm. systems are born. They don't come yeah. out perfect as a big, thick manual and hamburger university. That happens after 60 years of work. So you can't right. look at what McDonald's is today. You, you really need to go back and think it's about building this initial systems culture and the iteration that you're talking about. You just need right. to build a culture of constant and never ending improvement of the systems. So that's, that's so good. That's definitely a biggie. There's, there's quite a few others. I mean, some of them we touched on that idea of a lot of business owners, they think they're going to need hundreds of systems when really they might only need a handful Oftentimes, business owners, they tend to overcomplicate things when simple is the best way to go, like simple scales, complex fails. Uh, then okay. systems remove creativity. Uh, that's another big one. I found that in the video production business where we went on, out on a shoot one day and I went with Adrian because he needed someone to help him. Um, and in the drive on the way out to the shoot, we had a discussion about 
oh, did I bring the charger? Have I got the cable? Did we email the client to tell them not to wear checkered shirts because that looks bad on camera? Oh, what's the script going to be? What are my shots? Like you do all this, you know, extra batteries and second cameras and all this stuff that Mm. just should have been handled. And when I finished that shoot, I said, right, we have to create a checklist for this so that you know exactly what to do when uh, you're about to go on a shoot and what to pack, a a shoot checklist. So we put that together and about six months later, I went out on another shoot and the experience on the drive to the shoot was, couldn't be more different. Like he's sitting there contemplating, uh, you know, the scenes and the dialogue and what he wanted to get uh, for performance from the the actors and all these things that were the creative aspects that um, now had space for him to think about because all of the other stuff was handled. So a big misconception is that systems remove creativity when the reality is uh, when done right, they actually increase the space for creativity. Um, Some people go too far on it. Like I remember um, reading a, a book Uh, where Reed Hastings from Netflix was talking about when they introduced the systems into their business and uh, they, they wanted to dummy proof their business. So they systemized every aspect. Uh, But then he said, we went too far and then all we ended up hiring or people that wanted to work here were dummies because there wasn't enough room. So you have to find the balance. Like if you want great creative people to do great creative work, you need to create the space for that creative work and systemize everything else around it. Um, but there's, yeah, there's, there's quite a few. There's some of the more common misconceptions that I come across. And that's a big part of what I like to try and do is to break those misconceptions for the business owner, or at least test them. Cause it's almost like they just reach these conclusions. They say, oh, I'm not a business, uh, uh, sorry, I'm not a systems person. I've tried that before and it won't work. And now they've yeah. just completely closed off to the idea because maybe you know, one day in the past, they tried to write a checklist and they got frustrated by it for whatever reason and the team didn't follow it and now they say it doesn't work. Right. Um, but you, you can't give up on systems because it's really core for growing and scaling a business. If, if you ever want to have a business that works without you, you can't do it without systems and processes. So this is a problem you have to solve. And you can't just keep putting it off and it, it doesn't get easier. Like it's never going to be any easier than right now. So, you know, that, that's a lot of what I try and help the business owner to see some of these misconceptions and that they just really got to get started. Intentionally pausing because that right there, that was golden. That's going to be the clip we're going to circulate around social media, David. Um, And I love what you said, systems done right right? You, you can increase the space for creativity. I think like that is um, such an incredible thing for owners, for team leaders to hear, because it's not just about the work and go, go, go and making um, every single minute counts and being efficient and having it all perfect, right? There has to be that space and systems can help you do that. Um, so David, I know that you've got master classes and courses and you know you do consulting or your team does consulting where is the best place for people to um, find out more about you what's going on maybe is it your book or yeah. do, you have, do you have an alternate place for them where can you send our listeners today look if you're listening to this you're probably an audio person so just head over to audible and search systemology the books on there or you can grab it on amazon that's the best way because Uh, the book is useful and complete. It outlines the full methodology. And if you need more help, you can outreach to us. We've got a couple of different ways, but some people just take the book and run with it and implement it um, because everything that you need is like the full framework is in the book. Um, If if you need to find out a little bit more, systemology.com, that's uh, got some links through to our socials. We've got a a YouTube channel that's pretty active and uh, some other ways to connect with us as well. Beautiful. David, I can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, I love this conversation and I feel like I always cut these, you know, short uh, just because of of time, but I I so enjoyed our chat and I know we could have kept on talking um, all day about this, but I'm going to let you get to bed and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Thanks for, thanks for the chat.